Hi, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Today, we are back again with a day in the life of a CISO, and we have a very wonderful person, Jaya Balo, with us. She is doing security at Avast. I'll let her speak more about herself. Over to you, Jaya. Yes, thanks, Vandana. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, so, yeah, so I, I do security over at Avast, and uh, one of our core principles, which I'm super proud to stand behind, is this idea of digital freedom. It means you can only be free online and enjoy everything when you're not really concerned about security and privacy. Um, and the, this is something that, you know, we believe is a fundamental right for everybody. So I'm super happy to be part of that mission, which means that uh, security is for everyone and not just for those who can afford it. I totally agree with you. And I've always been inspired by your journey and the motive that you or the mantra that you mentioned is totally amazing because that's something I think we all should live by and uh, that only helps us grow I would do want to know your journey like I know your journey I have been like gushing over it uh, but I, I, I want people to know about it especially uh, when we met first at Malcon you shared some wonderful stories about how you started off in security and then your journey to be a CISO so we do want to know your journey as a CISO. Yeah, so again, I, I feel like I have the same origin story as a lot of people in our profession. I, I'm old. Um, so, you know, when I started, there were there were no real uh, educational paths for becoming a CISO or a security practitioner. You really started in a, in a technical space. And for me, it was really networking. So uh, I started just, kind of really basic with just understanding uh, network foundations. You know, how do uh, telecoms networks get built? What are they comprised of? What do routers, firewalls, and switches do? How do they interact? So that that's really where I started. And I started in the network operations center, you know, just monitoring the networks and the international uh, connections and ATM connections for those old people that still remember how to configure ATM uh, on Nortel network equipment. Um, so super old stuff. Um, but that's where I, I cut my teeth. And um, from then on, I moved to internal networks and was responsible for setting up, you know, the internal backbone of a telecom company and then moved through that to also architect um, uh, networks uh, also globally um, and then made like little MPLS networks and made internet backbones, which was super fun and built a small ISP. Um, and that's that's really where I, I learned the most, I think, about how not to build things and what the best way to uh, build secure infrastructure was. And when I did projects like Lawful Intercept projects, which meant that, you know, you're giving a really powerful instrument to law enforcement that it really became vital to understand who should access to it, how should it uh, be preserved correctly, uh, how do you preserve your audit trails, and how do you make sure that no unauthorized party has access. So, I mean, those kinds of concepts are still concepts that we use today about least privilege and defense in depth. So it was a good place to start. And then Really, the CISO thing was quite accidental. I was working as a security consultant at Verizon, um, and I got called uh, about a potential job at KPN. I initially turned it down, but the recruiter was really persuasive, so I tried it out with this idea, they'll never give it to me. They'll never make me the CISO. That's insane. You know, <laughs> They're looking for a man. Um, I really thought they were just looking for a guy to do this function, and at the time, that would have fit the stereotype. Um, so it was very unexpected when I got the job and I did it with a great deal of pleasure, stress, uh, <laughs> everything, um, for seven years from 2012 to 2019. And the, I think I was successful. And the greatest reason for that was because I had the most amazing team supporting me. Um, and after seven years of being a CISO at KPN, I moved uh, to Avast um, and I've been CISO there for about two and a half years, almost three years and a bit. Yeah, so this one point you mentioned that it was accidental, but then I'm sure uh, KPN must have seen something in you. That's why 
when they were uh, they were trying to hire you or they were chasing you to be their CISO. I'm sure there's something, but I want to know that something that what it takes to be a CISO. What do you feel that? Uh, what was that? I'm sure that everyone has some unique thing, and you have that unique thing, and you've been thriving amazing in the industry. I think. I don't know if I have, first of all, I don't think it's a unique thing. So I think that, um, first of all, it's something that everyone should have a little bit of, which is passion. Um, I, during my interview, I still remember that I was quite belligerent about, uh, KPN, by the way, I had also just had a hack. So I remember talking uh, to the people who were interviewing me um, ad nauseum about <laughs> the analysis of what happened and, you know, what could have gone better and, uh, because I thought I wasn't going to get the job anyway. I might as well tell them what I think, you know. And um, so I think the the thing that I really uh, had was I was really committed to doing something and making it better. Um, and I think passion always wins out. Everyone has some of it about something. And hopefully uh, people get a chance to exercise that passion by doing the thing that gets them so excited. Um, so I wish that for everyone, for my children, for my colleagues, I wish that everybody can actually come from a place of passion. And the second thing I want to say that I think we also need is if you've got this you know, amount of passion, you need to somehow temper it with patience because really a lot of passion and no patience means that you get frustrated really, really quickly. Um, so uh, I think you, you need to kind of balance the passion with a bit of patience in order to achieve anything. Yes, I totally agree with you. Um, because if you don't have that, then things generally go here and there. And you don't tend to uh, learn from it. Because when you have the passion, you have to invest time. At the same time, you have to learn new things. Yeah. Now, while we yeah. talk about learning new things, I do want to know that... Um, for a new CISO, like I want to be a CISO someday, maybe, I, maybe that happens someday, but for a new CISO within an organization, what would be, uh, what would you think that they need to do or they should do in the first 30, 60, 90 days? I've just heard people say that you need to have a, a balance of something in 30, 60, 90 days. Or do you think that when they first join in, they don't have to have a plan, but understand the organization or what should it, should, should they do? You know, I, I kind of did have a plan. Um, but again, I think I was, uh, it's kind of like um, having an idea for any type of design you want to do. You, you have an idea in your head about what good looks like. Um, and then you, what you do need to discover is what your perception of what good looks like. How does that match to the organizational ambition and needs? Um, and I think there is a bit of gap analysis that always needs to be performed because there's no such thing as a one size fits all security org or plan or strategy. You really do need to customize it. So, so that being said, I think you've got to do this. You have to start with a seed of, ah, oh, wouldn't it be cool if, so I always begin with a sort of what if experiment, um, uh, to understand like, what does good look like? Where are we now? And what if we could do that? You know, how do we make that leap uh, forward? So I have to say that 30, 60, 90 plan, day plan is not for nothing, something that's been thought out. Um, I think it's actually very valid. Um, and I do think you need to pace yourself because I think if you don't set yourself goals and milestones in between, uh, you can very quickly get overwhelmed with day-to-day -day incidental things that happen and you never actually achieve those important goals. You are only hopping from one urgent issue to the next one. You know, oh, I have to re uh, do a board paper. Oh, I have to get uh, introduced to this party. Oh, I have to suddenly handle this small incident. Or And instead of just running from crisis to crisis, having this foresight to plan ahead is really what will make you a success. Got it. Like, so you need to have a plan, you need to have a strategy to, to move ahead within the organization. Uh, and, and this thought always um, keeps me awake. Like when you are a CISO, especially if I, if I may put it right, that what I have seen from the past preachers that anything happens to an organization and CISO is the first person who's, who's like, cat, like they just catch. So um, at the same time, CISO is the person who is the key behind making some strategies making strategies around security. Now, as a CISO, um, how do you uh, like take those strategies to the board? 
Like, how do you get the buy-in? So I think the biggest thing you should remember with boards is, um, you know, they have a million issues to deal with and they are there to assist management uh, by usually asking the right questions and providing small, um, uh, how do you say, uh, incentives or small um, uh, ideas uh, and not doing any of the operational fully fledged out thinking, et cetera. But they're there to just kind of provide impulses, you know, and, and poke the board of management by providing this oversight perspective of, hey, have you thought about this? How does this work? Have you done that? Oh, perhaps you should think about looking at this company or working with this supplier or this regulatory concern or something else. So that, that's really the function. And when you take that in mind, you need to tailor your message for that audience. Know that they're not interested in all of your operational detail. They want to be put in a position where they can ask the right questions in order to make sure that the regular management is doing everything that they need to do uh, to address their risk appetite. And, and as a CISO, I think uh, what we need to do is make sure that message, that totally operational detailed overview <laughs> comes uh, to a higher level of strategic understanding that the board appreciates and understands uh, enough to ask those questions well. The best thing a CISO can do is try to make relevant what the security risks of a business mean in terms of financial uh, impact or business impact um, to you know, whatever business you're, you're trying to support um, or reputational loss or just trying to make this into more tangible things that a board can understand. That's got to be everyone's job. Thank you so much, uh, Jaya. I, I do want to know that what are the technological challenges that every CISO should know or the new technologies that are coming in the industry? Yeah, so, you know, I know that we're getting a lot of vendor push, but that I do think there are principles that we've had forever that we really need to embrace more thoroughly. Things like we've always known about principles of least privilege, right? So we're all trying to figure out how do we do that? And I do, you know, look, honestly, we've had a zero trust vendor wrapper uh, around for a while, but I really think it's time to embrace this when we're thinking about building our next generation networks. Everything we still have is legacy. Everything we need to build in terms of innovation really needs to be based on this principle. As we move the lines of demarcation between cloud and on-prem and employees everywhere, this is probably the most future fit uh, proposal for the way that we work and live in a post-COVID society. So we have to think about that. That being said, um, I think we also need to think as security professionals, how do I make my life easier? Right now, we're still drowning in data, logs, alerts, all over the place. And I feel like if there was one thing that we also need to get better is how do we actually learn from all of those AI machine learning folk? And again here, avoid the, the vendor buzzkill uh, vendor speak, but think about how we can actually start you know, rethinking uh, what we're getting from all of those Hadoop and Elastic clusters and think about how do we actually start searching and hunting for uh, security threats by using things like ML and Kibana and, you know, really doing a, mu a much better job of, of really being more proactive uh, and not just drowning in data. So I really want to, I'm not going to try to push any particular product, but I do think that we need to do a better job of getting that big data problem off of our back in terms of security and making it work for us. Um, because, you know, if you look at it and I speak to CISO, they're storing terabytes of data every day. Uh, just in terms of log information. That's also crazy. That's just nuts. So in order to be able to do anything historic, when we look at the size of the breach, we need to do that job better. And finally, you know, Vandana, I always talk about quantum. I feel like there too, we need to prioritize things that are important before they become urgent. So I really want uh, our security community to understand the threat and already staked steps to be able to like mitigate against it before it emerges on the horizon and it's too late. Right. And even uh, while you say that, there's one thing that comes to my mind. Like I remember that my first ransomware came in when we were like kids or some people were not even born. And now when we talk about 2022, we still see ransomware as attack happening. But as a security person, I do want to see new attacks happening rather than our kids facing the same old attacks. 
But look at why we still have ransomware. What I still find inconceivable to this day is the long tail of vulnerabilities, the long tail of the stuff that we already know how to do. We know how to do patch management. Why are we still being such ninnies about it? We, you know, we have architectures, we have frameworks, we have tools, Puppet, you know, we can do all of this. And if we cannot do it, if we have legacy infrastructure where it cannot be executed, again, we need to put a rope around our legacy and try to mitigate off of it as quickly as possible. So where I, where we have to, I always have a very simple line, you know, update everything and upgrade when possible. So that legacy stuff needs to be upgraded to new tech. If we did this in a consistent way, we would be able to avoid it. And you're right about ransomware, but the same thing is true of supply chain attacks. You know, where it's also one of those things where like, nothing new about supply chain attacks. We've had supply chain attacks forever. It's just mad. To go back to your question about ransomware for one second, um, the biggest problem we have is this long tail of vulnerability management. If we knew how to uh, update our stuff all the time and then upgrade from our legacy infrastructure to new infrastructure whenever possible, we would be okay. And we still have a very hard time doing this well. So uh, I think that, you know, we need to have a like almost a national strategy, how to prevent vulnerability management and make sure that all of the national certs as well as the, the national uh, cybersecurity infrastructures are helping companies and uh, institutions get themselves ready for the, you know this long tail of ransomware. It's definitely going to be there. And I mean, it's not just ransomware. It's also things like supply chain attacks. We see supply chain attacks being popular again, but they're not new, even though we treat them as new. They've been around forever. You know, they've been around since like the late 90s, early 2000s. And we have always been worried about hardware supply chain attacks. If you remember the super micro scare from the Bloomberg article, which we said, okay, probably didn't happen, but it could happen. Same thing with software based uh, supply chain attacks. And, you know, there are so many of them. Where do we start? And that's why I think all of the efforts around a secure bill of materials, things that Biden has recently signed into law in the United States, those are the kinds of things that I think we should see, see on the horizon and CISOs, not just CISOs who are um, selling software and hardware to downstream customers, but also obviously what they're ingesting. Uh, both sides of that equation need to be managed, both the upstream supply chain and the downstream supply chain. We need to make sure that we've got all of the practices in place to ensure that we know how to secure that for the future. And then a valid point. Even uh, when you talk about OWASP, like a ransomware, supply chain attacks, talk about OWASP. OWASP top 10 has been there for over 20 years, like around 20 years. Now, if we talk about the, the first time when A1 came in or the injection came in, mm -hmm. till today, I see that injection is a huge problem. Aren't yeah. we trying to solve it? We're trying, but then it's not enough. There's still something yeah. which we're missing out on. And suddenly we see these remote code execution attacks. So what to do with that? Yeah, no, it's funny. Um, a couple of years ago, uh, I've, when I was still working at Verizon, I think it was uh, Daniel Meisner who was mm -hmm. doing all of the OWASP top 10 for IoT devices. Remember? I don't know. It was a Daniel. I, well, I it's, yeah, it could be Daniel Meisner. Yeah. Yeah. So he was doing the OWASP top 10 for IoT. And, you know, like now what's changed? Uh, there's still in, uh, insufficient, you know, default credentials that are issued with the device that don't get changed. There's still like improper update mechanisms. There's still like everything that was on that original list is still applicable to the majority of devices today. And we can say caveat emptor until the cows come home, but buyers are not careful. Or there, it's, there is no buyer beware. They just want to look at the cheapest price of stuff that you're actually creating this market for crappy products to excel and good products to be forced off the market. Yeah, because the good products, they cost too much. The buyer doesn't know that they're good or better than the crappy products with the same price point. So the crappy products get sold for a higher price point. The good products cannot be sold for the lower price point. So they get pushed off you know, completely gone out of the market. And then we only are left with the crappy products. And that is the market of lemons dilemma that we've got in pretty much everything cybersecurity related that we want users to make good choices over. We, we haven't set it up for them to be able to make those good choices. 
So we're going to be in business for a long time. I mean, that's the job security and security, I suppose. I agree with you on that. Like, that's making our job secure. But then talk about the number of vendors that, that have come in the market. It's huge. What to choose is, again, another dilemma. Everyone is trying to pick and choose what is, like, uh, the best for others. But they don't realize that I need to choose what's best for my organization. And that's where um, the good products go out of the market. So there's this, uh, I forgot what the, it's called. I think it's called cybersecurity ventures or one of these firms that look at, you know, the development of the cybersecurity market. It's in the trillions, you know, it's, it's insane. Actually, I'm saying it wrong. It's in the billions. The cybersecurity market for, for professional goods is in the uh, billions and it keeps increasing year on year. But um, if you take a look at the cyber crime market, that's actually in the trillions. And it's actually the cyber crime market is more profitable than the entire international drug trade. So we take the whole global drug trade. All right. So if you're a criminal today and you're like, hmm, I wonder what I should be doing. Should I be in cocaine transport or in cyber crime and ransomware? It's really simple. If you have a brain, you're going to be in the ransomware business, you're not going to be trying to smuggle cocaine because it's way more profitable. And uh, folks like Kim Jong Il, who or Un, Kim Jong Un, who is making a ton of money on ransomware, I mean, people just want to follow his example, which is insane. We live in a in a really crazy planet at the moment. Right, and and while we talk about all of these things, I'm sure there are a few technologies which a CISO needs to know, like at least some of them. So what are the two technologies that a CISO should know when they are stepping into it? Because we see CISO from, uh, uh, from technology, uh, from risk management, from uh, different areas of cybersecurity, and sometimes not even cybersecurity. So what do you think that the, the two things that a CISO should know or two technological things that a CISO should know? Yeah, so I, I, you know, again, I came from a very humble networking angle. So I still think that there is a lot to be learned by understanding how networks are built and also for the whole new cloud paradigm, which is not so new, but the whole cloud paradigm, which is something that's still new for a lot of companies. I think understanding the shifts in networking is really important. Um, so really the interplay between what we had versus where we're going, that's one area and the other technological area that I think we really need to be aware of is really understanding what type of tools and capabilities you need in order to be able to trust your software. And that is from a perspective, not just of what you build by yourself, but what you're buying from others. Um, I do not feel that we are currently capable, even though we're supposed to be the experts at making good choices uh, when it comes to the understanding the entire software stack. And you see this when we're all running around like lemmings uh, with Log4j um, this winter. So where vendors are still like, I have no idea where I integrate the library. I don't know when I'm going to integrate or have a patch. And then when they do have a patch, there are still issues with installing it because it breaks everything else. So, you know, so it's like got patch, great, usable, no, not so much. And then what, you know? And so really these two paradigms of understanding the shifts in networking technology and then understanding issues with uh, software security, both your own and those you consume, these are, I think for from a CISO perspective, the biggest things you need to be able to understand. and. Look, I know not every CISO wants to be or is technical and is indeed from a risk management perspective, but I, I get super comfortable when I understand the detail. Um, so I'm hoping that there's some level of capability from a CISO to do either one of those things to a detailed level. I absolutely agree with you on that. And um, especially uh, when we talk about these strategies, I'm sure that, you, that as a CISO, you'll have to work on um, some tasks where a lot of teams are involved mm -hmm. and uh, a lot of people are involved. So how do you balance that out? How do you bridge those teams? And specifically now we see that sometimes the breach happens because of some employee lost their password or they, they were using a secure password. So how do you balance it out? How do you make sure that uh, the people from the ground up understand the security and, and get them connected to you? 
Yeah. So like I said, you know, informing the board of all those risks and understanding all those questions, it's not just one person's job. It's certainly not just the security. It's everyone's job in a way, because that's what who if you're addressing the board, that that's what you have to do. Uh, we developed something that we can use to talk to boards, but also different parts of the business. When I was at KPN called the FOSI calculator, you can get it. It's open source. We pushed it with our uh, KPN security policy app. It's in the iOS store and the app store. It's all free. There's no tracker. It's all open. And it's basically the entire KPN security policy, but also some tools for other security professionals. And the FOSI calculator allows you in a really simple way to try to look at the potential harm of security incidents from a financial impact perspective and, you know, all of the loss uh, impact that you could have as an organization. And it gives you a number. So it's really, really, again, it's super simple. It's not meant to be a scientific evolved methodology, but if used consistently can actually give you a proper representation of your potential residual risk. So um, we use that tool to say, okay, so let me get this straight. <laughs> We're not gonna implement tool X to prevent uh, attack Y. Well, let's calculate what would happen if this attack Y actually happened to our uh, company. So we run through the tool and we look at, okay, what's the likelihood of occurrence, what's the potential of impact on all of the different areas, and then it spits out a number. We never do this by ourselves. We do this with the part of the business that doesn't want to implement the anti-phishing tool, the firewall scanner, the blah, 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 whatever it is that they, they feel like, no, we don't want to do this. Okay. So then we take a look at what's the impact. And when we look at that, it's almost always the case that they realize, let's implement the thing because to, we'd rather implement it than take the hit from the potential loss. And that's the type of conversation basis that we should be having because no one uh, unless you are working in the risk or security department, no one has this proper understanding of all the risks. How could they? So it's about making that approachable discussion. And that is a equivalent for both the board as well as other parts of the companies in order to affect behavior change. You need to be able to present it to them in a way where they can also weigh the balance. You know, and if they see that the loss of, you know, this data or whatever problem happens as a result of not implementing this is 10 million euros per year or dollars per year, but the cost of implementing the solution is 300K. You know, it's an easy win. Let's just spend 300,000 and we avoid a five or 10 million risk. That's simple. And if we can try to bring it to this level where we have a common consensus and understanding of both the risk and the impact, you know, we'd be in so much better shape because we would understand the long tail of things like vulnerability management of, you know, <laughs> phishing scams and all the other so-called advanced attacks that have super humble origins, like indeed credential theft or password loss or, yeah, someone clicked on a stupid link, you know, that, uh, yeah. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> I think these things can't be avoided. We have seen these cases happening with the um, with a with a national level as well, where just a small mistake leads to a big big issue in the whole country, and then suddenly everyone is facing that. Now, there's one thing that I do want to know, uh, specifically if let's say there's someone who's a new person or who's a budding CISO, if they mm -hmm. wanted to join any organization, so what would be your advice to them, or maybe some pieces of advice to them? that they should keep in mind always. You mean if they want to join a new organization as a CISO? Yes. Um, there's no one who's smart enough uh, or good enough or what, no one can do anything without a good team. So having uh, a good team around you, um, not just a high performance culture, but a, a culture of trust and openness uh, where people feel motivated to make decisions, people feel empowered to talk to you, uh, to disagree. I think this is this the most valuable thing that a good CISO or any good manager, and honestly, can do is to create that culture around them and uh, really try to promote another idea, which I think is really important, which is very difficult to do because it's very easy. And I've been there. It's very easy to have an us versus them culture in security, 
uh, where we're like, oh, the stupid users, oh, that dumbass IT department. I wish CTO would get their act together, those idiots, you know, and that us versus them culture is not conducive to actually getting this mentality of security is everyone's job. Uh, security depends on everyone to do it right. Uh, security is behavior change. If we really want that, it's not an us versus them. So two things, again, make sure that your team is empowered to do the decision making and has the ability to disagree. It's super important because otherwise you have the emperor's new clothes uh, type of phenomenon where everyone tells you what a great plan it is, but then you still get hacked. Um, and at the same time, that type of openness and fostering of trust and disagreement in your own team should also be there for the wider community so that you're approachable and can have that discussion. And it's an us, all of us, rather than us versus them from the CISO department to the rest. Yeah, that's a very wonderful advice, specifically that we have to all work together and security is everyone's responsibility. If one yeah. say that, yeah, it's only my responsibility, then things will fall. Yeah, and Vandana, I have to ask you, because you know this, you know, you're a chairwoman of OASP. I mean, how often is it that you don't see devs clash with the internal security team, you know, and the devs want to do it one way. They don't understand why, why security is being such a blockade. Hey, we always used to configure Kubernetes this way, you know, screw off with your ideas. We don't want them. So that that clash isn't really good we need to be able to resolve those and really have, how do we approach it better? Um, and, and that is something that I think is not easy, but is definitely necessary for any good CISO to be able to achieve. Uh, yes, that's right. Because if we don't have that culture, then whatever we do, we can have the best of people, we can have yeah. best of process, we can have best of technology, but all of these things will fail. Yeah. We need to have the right culture. And yeah. the one thing that you truly said that you need to have trust in your people. That's the most important aspect. Yeah, yeah, I see it all the time. And you, we have people uh, and we hire them to say, hey, uh, what do you think I should do? And then we completely ignore their opinion or we supersede them because, you know, and I find this ridiculous because this is the biggest flaw in security. We don't see everything. We don't control everything. You cannot prevent every horrible thing from happening. So you need that force of community, both the security community that you have uh, within the business, as well as the rest of the business with you. You need that alignment if you really wanna make sure that it's gonna be a long-term success. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. And um, I think that's gonna take us a long way if we understand these aspects. It was wonderful chatting with you and uh, I'm always inspired by the work that you do and the way you share your experiences with everyone. It is totally incredible. No, it's my pleasure. I just, uh, I, I love talking to you and I wish we could do it longer. So <laughs> you're always <laughs> welcome. Thank you so much.